we are live ah yes sir principal sir speaker ah namaskaram namaskaram and good morning to all i welcome i welcome our proud alumni mr guru diyag uh, sir um on behalf of our management and department of mechanical engineering um also i welcome our um, dean mechanical and civil engineering dr krishnan sir and all other participants um it's our uh, happy and blessings uh, to have an excellent webinar from our uh, proud alumni uh, mr um, guru diyag this webinar is about uh, pressure equipment in oil and gas industries um it is conducted by our mechanical engineering department um in this webinar excellent knowledge and experience will be shared by our uh, proud alumni mr guru diyag sir actually he belongs to 1999 passed out uh, batch um he was a first batch student of our um, b mechanical engineering now he is an international expert he is uh, working as an engineering consultant in orly company australia uh, so this webinar will be very useful to all the participants i request all the participants uh, to use this golden opportunity for enriching your knowledge also i request you to post your comments and queries uh, in the chat box now i request our proud alumni mr guru diyag to share his knowledge and experience with our participants uh, please go ahead sir thank, thank you, you. Yeah. Um, thank you sir uh, good afternoon everyone uh, i like to thank them sir <coughs> amabalan sir principal sir and um, sk sir dean of mechanical and ceo of college um, mr chandrasekhar sir for the wonderful opportunity uh i i am um like uh, myself is guru a um, mechanical engineer from gs public college i passed out in 99 proud to say i am from the first batch um it's always exciting you know to get back with the college and any way you can do uh, i welcome you all to the uh, webinar which will be on overview of pressure equipment used in the oil and gas industry and before we start I just want to share like uh, I was about to use my iPad for the presentation but some glitch last minute so I'm using my iPhone probably the slide is too small for me to uh, look in and talk about so you don't mind like I'll be looking into my iPad which I kept in the side so I will look into that and take through as we progress so share uh, okay welcome you all again let's start now uh, what you'll be seeing in the next half one hour is like uh, a uh, challenge norm that's usually something which a startup uh, discussion on anything about uh, something that enlightens us or something that gives us some better you no know, way of uh, doing things that's a two minute talk then what we are going to see is i thought rather than straight away jumping into pressure equipment i thought i'll give a overview of oil and gas industry and what a pressure equipment is all about and what is its significance how it is designed and then take you through the pressure equipment used in oil and gas industry and finally we have questions i'm happy to take all the questions uh, if unable to do it today please feel free to contact me through sk sir i'm always available to share my knowledge or any career guidance that you may have next one challenge no uh, this is something like at oil and gas industry we start every meeting with a small pep talk it's mostly to do with uh, non technical stuff it's basically all about how to maintain uh, safety in our daily life or industry practice or about it could be about physical well being or about mental health or it could be anything that that people share from their past experience so today i'm going to just uh, take you through a challenge norm like uh, you'll see what way it's going to um, help us i feel so it's all about a small story uh, this is called fable of five monkeys it's an, a story which was done as a social ex experiment uh, in the year 1960s by someone called uh, as or stephen sir excuse me sir yep oh, sir slide yes, sir. Varla, sir. slide varla ungalde photo mundana varudhu oh like i'm sharing the slide ஒரு 
So just I'll just slightly go back to the previous slide. Yeah, agenda for today is like uh, the meet webinar is about oh, presentation of uh, equipment and oil and gas industry. Uh, I thought before we just go into pressure equipment, just have an overview of oil and gas industry, what a pressure equipment is about, uh, history of pressure equipment, and then I will take you through the overview of pressure equipment and oil and gas industry. And the last is questions. I'm happy to take questions. In case if you can't do it because of time or any other reasons, please feel free to contact me through SK, sir. I'm happy to help whatever way I can do it. Uh, the first one is challenge norm. It's like in, in oil and gas industry, I'm sure with any other industry, before you start any presentation or any seminar, there is always a small pep talk that's about uh, safety or uh, physical well-being or mental well-being or just sharing lessons from the past. So today we are going to see something about challenge norm. It's about an interesting social experiment done in 1960s. It's fable of five monkeys. Like uh, what they did was a social experiment. They put five monkeys inside a room and kept a ladder and placed a banana on top of it. As usual, monkeys start, uh, see a banana, try to eat it. So they climb the ladder. Once a monkey climbed the ladder, they started to spray water on every monkeys and they were like kind of shocked. So they get down and then after some time, they again tried to climb the ladder, water was sprayed, the monkeys started, uh, stopped climbing the ladder. After some time, the water was permanently turned off. No monkeys tried to climb the ladder. Give me an idea. Okay. So what they did was now, they replaced one of the monkeys with a new monkey. If the new monkey tries to climb the ladder, all other monkeys attack and beat him. Replacement continues at some point of time. All the old four monkeys were replaced with new ones. But each time a monkey tries to climb the ladder, the other monkeys attack and beat him. This is like kind of the norm is being set now. So what's happened if you follow the norm? Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to get the screen here. Apologies. So the result of following norm, eventually all the monkeys, original monkeys were replaced. None of the monkeys are ever being sprayed with water. None of the monkeys climb the ladder. The bananas go rotten. So what we do is like how to avoid having rotten bananas. Always challenge the norm. Always look for a better way. Embrace new technology and adapt a can-do attitude. Always keep an open mind. Why I thought I will share this today is like the world is changing very fast. You know, automation is taking over regular jobs and like, the jobs what we see today may not be like in another 10, 15 years. It might be extinct. In my father's generation, people used to work in one company, start in one company and end up in the same company. So in our generation, in my generation, we change companies very frequently, two, three years once, and that has become a norm. Everyone is doing that. I think moving forward in five, 10 years time, especially for the 2K kids, I think you might end up doing a multiple career, not only sticking to one professional career, probably we may need to do multiple jobs to keep us going in the market. So prepare yourself with open mind and most importantly, embrace new technologies. That, that's the fable of five monkeys. This is what just I wanted to share with you all. And now, now go, let's go for the overview of pressure equipment, oil and gas industry. Yeah. The details discussed here are very simplified versions. We have just taken the very basic detail about oil and gas industry and shared here. Pictures and drawings were obtained from public domain, web pages, industry seminars, and personal pictures. It's more of a disclaimer. Let's, let's Let's start uh, how petroleum and natural gas is formed. I'm sure everyone is aware how oil and gas is formed. Just a recap of how it is formed. Marine plants and animals died millions of years ago. They were buried deep inside the ocean. Over the years, like millions of years, sand, silt, and rock formed over it. And continuing few million years down the lane, the increased pressure and heat 
resulting from overlying rock transform the decayed matter into oil and gas, basically hydrocarbon matter. And today we drill down through the layers of sand and rock and we explore the oil. What is petroleum? Petroleum is derived from Latin word. Petro means rock, oleum means gas, oil, sorry. Therefore, petroleum stands for oil from rock or rock oil. And we also always hear another word like hydrocarbon. Petroleum and hydrocarbon are essentially the same. Hydrocarbon is another word for petroleum in any form. Petroleum can be in gas form or in oil form. The generic term used is hydrocarbon. Why it is called hydrocarbon? We all know living matter is made up of four major elements, like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. They make up to 96% of it, and the rest all calcium, potassium, phosphorus, water, or small elements manages the rest 4%. So like after millions of years of a decay, what is left in the organic matter, we call it as fossil, is only carbon and hydrogen. They form a chain, a little bit of oxygen. So all essential fossil fuels are chains of carbon and hydrogen. That's why we call it as a hydrocarbon. Now, we have seen how the oil and gas is formed. Let's see what's the use of oil and gas in our life. We use oil and gas to propel vehicles, heat our buildings, and to produce electricity. The industrial sector, petroleum product is used in many ways. They're used to make plastics, fertilizers, pesticides, rubber, lubricants, you name it, I think over 100 products. I just put a picture of all this, try to put a picture of that the basic use of oil and gas in our life. Now let's see characteristics of oil and gas industry. Yeah, uh, the first one is large investment. Any oil and gas project can easily reach up to $1 billion, easily. That's that's the minimum the project will cost, $1 billion US dollar. Mega projects can cost up to $20 billion US dollar. That is from explore, exploration to the point of oil and gas processed. I'm saying end to end process, it will cost around 20 billion for a mega project. Mid size project is around 10 billion US dollar. 10 billion US dollars is like 1 billion is 6,000 crores times 10, 60,000 crores easily. If you have time, please Google out a project called Gorgon, G O R G O I N. It's an LNG project done in Australia, completed five years ago. And the cost of the project is 50 billion US dollar. That's the second most expensive energy project done next to International Space Station. So when you say it's large investment, it's really a large investment oil and gas industry. Second, high risk in all aspects, people safety, environment, uh, reputation, everything, everything is like high exposed to high risk. I will give you an, one example. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of that. In 2010, there was a big oil leak in Gulf of Mexico, US. BP is one of a major oil and gas company and they own the platform in Gulf of Mexico, US. One of the rig, oil rig exploded and it caused a major oil and gas disaster in the history. Like the estimate is 5 million barrels of oil was spilled or leaked to the coast. So what happened? The initial oil rig explosion killed 11 people and injured 17 others. So if you don't have a proper safety, people are gone. They will just, you know, a lot of fatalities or casualties can happen in oil and gas industry. And how environment can be affected? The oil spilled for 125 kilometers or 125 miles, sorry, 125 miles along the coast of Gulf of Mexico. Over 8,000 animals like water uh, birds or sea life, marine life, those were in endangered list all got extinct within six months of time after the spill. That that could be the danger, danger of, sorry, the impact oil and gas spill can make to environment. You know, like BP was made to pay $40 billion as a fine, 40 billion US dollars a fine to as a penalty, rather, I would say as a penalty for uh, recklessness or the carelessness that has cost human life, environmental issues, so reputations at stake. So this this gives you idea of like how how risky is this business is. High rewards and returns. 
with high risk always you get high rewards and returns oil and gas is a very cash rich business and people companies do make a lot of money but it's it's a very high risk business and the business a long term business sometimes the investment what you make 20 billion 50 billion dollar will take at least 15 20 years to break even or depending upon the type of crude or the type of uh, you know technology you apply to that and uh, it involves complex operation sorry complex operation multidisciplinary experts like process engineers chemical engineers mechanical civil structure instrumentation technicians like thousands of people are required to ensure the plant is maintained and operated in a safe way and oil and gas industries of strategic value needless to say oil is always political and economic the oil price grows goes up the bread what we eat goes up price goes down everything goes down so this gives you overview of oil and gas industries. Then I would like to take you towards the segment of oil and gas industry. Oil and gas industry is uh, divided in three sectors, upstream, midstream, and downstream sectors. Upstream is all about finding oil from seabeds or from land. It's called exploration, finding oil and apply the right technology and take the oil from seabed or from the ground and bring it to the surface. It's, it's, it has got a small processing facility to separate oil, gas, and water. And this business is called as, this part of business is called as exploration and protection. And then the midstream. Midstream is about, you find the oil now, you're processed to an extent, but most of the time, uh, the ENP business happens 50 or 60 kilometers into the sea or far away place in a country. So you have to bring it to a place where it can be refined. So the transportation of oil is either through tankers, the picture what you see there, or it could be like uh, road tankers, or it could be by pipelines. So that, that sector which transport oil from the place where it is extracted to a refined business is called um, midstream. And the downstream is the place where the crude is actually refined to get a number of products Basically, it's a refining process uh, that includes of refinery, petrochemical, and chemical industries. And the end product is what you see in the petrol bunks oil. That's where the common man gets to see the petrol. But there is a lot of technology and people involved and process behind the petrol what we get. Let's see how much of oil is being consumed a day. As per International Energy Report, 98 million barrels of oil is being consumed a day. One barrel is like around 160 liters, so 98 million times 160 liters. That's the consumption of oil per day in the world. And 50%, I would say 45% is consumed by USA, China, India, and Japan. The rest of the countries take the balance 50% share. Let's see who consumes what in this 98 billion, billion barrels of oil per day. So if you see the 40 plus percent shown in blue color is by light vehicles. It's basically you and me driving motor, bike and cars. We are the major consumer of oil, automobiles basically. It doesn't include heavy trucks or transportation buses, just the light vehicles. So now you can imagine what COVID has done to oil and gas industry. People stayed indoors across the globe. Oil was not consumed, oil for the first time reached a negative price. So 50% of 40% of consumption is by uh, on-road transportation, light vehicles, cars, and bikes. That's the major consumer. The rest 30% is for industrial use. It's basically commercial electricity generation and balance all by heavy vehicle trucks, sea transportation, jet aviation fuel. fuel. Yeah. This is oil consumption by sector. Next, uh, I want to share uh, the companies in the world, the biggest oil and gas companies. The largest oil and gas company is a Chinese company called Sinopac. Look at their revenue, it's $432 billion, $432 billion US dollars for the year 2019. Imagine their revenue. The next is Royal Dutch, it's a Holland company. The list goes on, quite popular, come big, Companies, they're called integrated companies. They do have the entire business upstream, midstream, and downstream. They call IOCs, integrated oil companies. They explore, they transport, and they sell. You can see a lot of petrol bunks, shell, 
or BP or Caltech Chevron everywhere around the world. So this gives a slight overview of basics of uh, oil and gas industry. Next, I will take you through a small slide. This is a very basic schematic of oil and gas processing facility, a very simplified version. Um, just give me a minute, let me zoom it up in my iPad. If you see like uh, on the left side, you see multiple gray arrows pointing out that indicates the oil being taken out from well. Look at the pressure, it's 200 bar gauge. This is just a random number. Pressure can vary from 50 to 100 bar, 300 bar, depending upon value drill uh, driller rig. So the oil and gas mixture comes at 200 bar gauge, and then it goes through a piping manifold. Piping manifold is nothing but a big pipe with multiple branching. Depending upon the level of uh, quantity of oil and gas comes out, they might take it up in two or three parallel trains. We call it as a train, like three units that I would say put simply. Uh, you see the first uh, equipment is marked as a production separator, high pressure. I, I think people, you can follow the sketch. The first equipment is a separator. This is where the mixture of oil and gas and water is separated into three separate streams. The first equipment separator separates the crude comes as a mixture actually, it, come, it doesn't come as a oil, it comes as oil, gas and water mixture. The first step is to separate them into three different streams. So separator does that function. Let's take the oil line and follow it till the end. From the first uh, high pressure separator, oil line is shown at the end, right side of the end, a small thick line shows oil. Just follow that. It goes to the second vessel, which is marked low pressure. It's basically a repeat of first step but again, they're, they're uh, removing out gas and oil and water again from the outlet oil, whatever remaining carried out from the first stage of separation. From the second stage of separation, the oil is taken out. It is heated to a certain condition. If you need to transport crude, it has to be kept at a certain pressure and at a temperature to avoid losses through vaporization when they transport it across pipelines or across sea. So you need to maintain a certain temperature and that goes through equipment which is mopped 20 by 40 degrees. It's a heat transfer equipment. So the you know, crude is heated over there and then it is being pumped. You need pressure to keep the fluid moving for 40, 50, 60, 70 kilometers. The pumps gives the energy for the fluid to flow down to where they want to take it. So that's a very simple schematic of oil line. Let's go back and take the water line. Uh, the water is basically after separation, the water will have still, still certain amount of oil dispersed in it. So in industry, there are strict marine regulations to preserve the marine life. You cannot dump water just like that in sea. So it has to be treated. Treated in the sense, the remaining oil in the water has to be removed. When the water is dumped into the sea, it should have only a little of water. So that's the process that happens. There's a hydrocyclone, the water oil mixture is forced towards uh, towards uh, equipment called hydrocyclone. It works on centrifugal effect principle. It goes spirals around very fast. And the oil particles are thrown out and it is get collected separately and water flows out and it is being dumped. Let's go to the gas line on the top. Basically gas line, what they do is like they take out the oil water from the gas before it is being exported. It is fed through a cycle of compression, heating, compression, heating. The first equipment, if you see, if you follow the gas uh, uh, from the top, just take towards a scrubber vessel. Uh, the purpose of scrubber vessel is to knock out, take out the liquid entrapped in the gas, basically it's water. So the scrubber vessel is used to do that, for, to that knocking off. And then the gas is compressed to required pressure. It is repeat, the cycle repeats two or three cycles of uh, uh, knocking out, compression, knocking out, compression to achieve the required gas specification. Gas should have least amount of water droplets. We are talking about microns, not the actual uh, water droplets, what we see. So this gives you an overall uh, very basic schematic of oil and gas processing facility. I've just shown five to 10 equipments. In reality, the facility will have 100 or equipments of different processing nature, a lot of instrumentation, a lot of electrical equipment, compressors and turbines to give power supply, multiple pumps, you name it, 
whole the uh, engineering equipment is all the oil and gas facility but just for our uh, webinar i kept it very bare minimum and then let's uh, talk about uh, pressure equipment um just give me a sorry there is a lot of uh, discussion happens when we go for a pressure equipment in oil and gas industry let's see what a pressure equipment is a simple sketch what is a pressure equipment a container designed to hold gas or liquid please remember this word designed a container is designed to hold a gas or liquid at a pressure higher than atmospheric pressure the pressure is much higher than atmospheric pressure it's more than definitely one bar gauge and this equipment do not have any moving parts inside like a pump or a compressor which has got a rotor spinning to impart energy this pressure equipment do not have any moving part it's a static equipment we call it as a static equipment as well how does it look you can see two different um, construction of a cylinder it can be in a vertical orientation or in horizontal orientation uh, and when you talk about the pressure the pressure inside the equipment can range from 1 bar to 300 bar is just a number it is it is depending upon the pressure at which uh, the oil comes from the well if you remember the previous slide we saw it's around 200 bar and pressure equipment can theoretically be made to any shape but the industry practice is to limit it to cylindrical or spherical or conical shape the most common design that industry follows is a cylindrical vessel a cylindrical shell with end caps the end caps are often in spherical or an elliptical shape this is a very basic overview of pressure equipment the next i, th I thought i'll just put a 3d view of this uh, the cylinder is called shell in industrial terms and it is supported and you'll see a lot of um, connections in and out basically the fluid comes into the vessel through a flange connection and goes out again to a flange connection any connection on a vessel equipment is flanged i just put a small sketch to to give idea of what flange is about it's basically a piece of uh, plate used to connect a pipe or pipe to pipe or pipe to a vessel and this vessel is always not fully filled it's partially filled with water uh, sorry uh, with uh, fluid and it has got multiple connections for either to measure the pressure of fluid inside or the temperature of fluid inside or basically you want to control the level you want to pump in more or take out more to do that function you have got few instruments onto it this is a vertical vessel vertical pressure equipment and this is another example of horizontal pressure equipment the philosophy is same just the the way it is supported is different in horizontal direction and you see at the end the end cap is called elliptical end and if you can see like you'll see a thick line between the cylinder and the end that's the welding which is done to connect two metal parts moving on okay like so what is so significant about this pressure equipment what is why it is so much of um, hype around that so these equipment operate at very high pressure you have seen them reached up to 200 bar and the vessel diameter vessel internal diameter could be like in the range of one meter diameter to three meter or four meter so when you have an internal pressure and fluid is stored inside a container it has got a lot of energy it exerts pressure on the cylinder shells so higher the pressure and bigger the size of equipment the energy of stored fluid is very high in case of any rupture the extent of damage is very high so pressure equipment safety is very imperative in the industry that's why there are a lot of regulations around building a pressure equipment let's let's see a small example you know like pressure cooker what we use at home is also a pressure equipment so this pressure vessel cooker at our home operates at less than one bar it should not exit 15 psi that's the norm of the industry so if we have to design a pressure cooker which is a 5 liters of capacity in this case of example what i have here is like what's the diameter there it's 7 inches of radius so 14 inches of diameter and uh, we have a material of uh, allowable stress 20000 psi and if you have to decide what should be the thickness of this cooker not to avoid to blast 
is is what we have to calculate the thickness, the factor of 62.4. Probably give a try. Uh, it's basic, it's very basic calculation, but I just want to share something later on this one. We'll get back to this. Remember, pressure cooker is a small equipment with five to six liter capacity. The pressure inside is one bar, less than a bar. So what happens if a pressure cooker explodes? It's something very, very, you know, we don't care about this many times, but explosion do happen. I just picked a case. A woman in India was permanently blinded in her left eye after a pressure cooker exploded. The full extent of injury was not known until a CT scan was done. When they did CT scan, they saw the cooker whistle. It has lodged into deep into the skull. So that's, that's the impact. If a pressure cooker, 5 liter capacity, Operating at one bar, if that blast, that the whistle, what we see daily at a home, can lodge into your skull. The projectile is very high. The pressure of energy release is very high. She had to undergo a surgery, but unfortunately, the doctor couldn't save her vision, but she, like, she is okay, saved. So there is a lot of um, lawsuits being made every year. It's very interesting now. If you have time, just click at the link below. You will be surprised to see how many the people in different countries are lodging cases against home pressure cooker explosion. Just keep that in mind. So the cooker filter capacity explodes can damage so much. Imagine explosion consequences of industry equipment, which is operating at 300 bar or 400 bar and thousands of liters of uh, volume. It's unimaginable. Let's, let's see. So let's see like, uh, history of pressure equipment, what happened in history of pressure equipment and why there are so many regulations and how it came to, how it, how or when they were created. So what you see is a picture of a factory in America in the year 1905. It's, it says March 20, 7.45 a.m. It's a four-story building and they used to make uh, some, I don't know, they called it a shoe factory, grower shoe factory. Yeah. So what happened at the lower level of the building, probably say ground level. They had a boiler, a boiler is a pressure equipment and it was not attended for a long time. Like the boiler lost the control, like temperature sensing control. So because of overheating, the boiler suddenly blew apart and rocketed up to the four floors. The next picture, what you'll see is the boiler tore all the four floors. Imagine the pressure uh, energy which with it blew apart. It, it from the ground floor, two, three, four. It tore all the four floors and fly away and fall in the city center. This is an image of city center where the boiler flew up, flew flew down. And see the boiler there. It, it is like kind of very huge disaster. But this disaster caused a death of fifty plus people. And, and like injured 100 people like, and also cost a quarter million dollar damage for the property. Imagine like, like flowing through the four levels of floor damaging the property is huge. Uh, needless to say, this caught the attention of government in America. Prior to this incident, there have been many accidents, but the pressure vessels or boilers were made based on individual knowledge of uh, engineering, whatever they think this should be the thickness of the plate or this is the way you calculate uh, and weld a pressure vessel or a boiler. That was the practice till till this incident. So this incident uh, um, you know, made the government to make think of making regulations to save people. So uh, various states in America had different sets of regulations. They thought there should be uniform regulation across America. So they create they approached AS and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and requested them to to come up with a set of regulations and rules and regulations for the design, construction, fabrication, and inspection of pressure vessels. That's how uh, ASM, we call it as ASME code for uh, pressure vessels came into existence. So that just it's again a recap of what happened. The ball explosions were common in the early 1900s. Thousands of people died across the world and the government came up with the regulations and that's the ASME code. So what does the ASME code uh, talks about, it talks about the design, materials, fabrication, inspection, and testing of pressure equipment. Basically, they establish uh, rules of safety, 
governing the design and fabrication inspection. It's a code book. If you have to ever design equipment in the industry, you just follow the rules. It has got, it has, it's over a thousand pages. It says what to do and what not to do. We simply follow that. There is no room for experiment there. Simply follow the SME design code. And these are the various codes, not only in America, slowly every country develops their design codes. In America, we call for pressure vessels and boil, unfired, it's not fired, it's unfired pressure vessels and boilers. They use ASME. ASME stands for American Society of Mechanical Engineers, Section 8, Division 1. It's a rule book, basically. You don't need to remember everything. Just I'm sharing the information. In UK, we've got PD 5500. Germany, ADMR Blatter, and Australia, AS1210. These are very quite uh, used, industrially used codes. And every country has their own inter international, uh, in, sorry, uh, national codes like Belgium, China, Japan, India, Sweden, France. You go to any country, they'll have their own boilers and pressure vessel codes. Now let's quickly run through what a vessel design is. I think we are running a bit late, I think. Yeah. Uh, let's see what a vessel design is. We just had an overview of what a pressure equipment is and how the rules came into existence and what the SME does. Let's quickly see like uh, what we do in vessel. When I say vessel, it's a pressure equipment design. The loads, what we consider to a design is internal pressure, the fluid pressure, which is acting inside the vessel. The container has to be designed. Remember the first slide I said, container to be designed. This is exactly for this reason, internal pressure. And then when you drain the liquid out completely, sometimes the external pressure acts on it. That's like when you take too fast water from a plastic tank, you will see the plastic tank bulging in and out. That is quite okay with the water tank, but the same thing can't happen with the vessel with hydrocarbon, you know, like if that explodes, the disastrous. So we have to design for the external pressure and then by heat of the vessel, you have to support the vessel. Other than that, a wind can topple any equipment for a cyclone or high pressure wind, high speed wind, sorry. Earthquakes are common everywhere. So we have to design the equipment to make sure it can stand earthquake. And there are other technical items like fatigue, local loads, which is more you will get to know once you get into the industry. Basically remember like the equipment is designed for internal pressure, external pressure, wind and seismic loads. All you are bending on diagram, shear force diagram, whatever you study in the college, this is simply where you apply all this here in design of pressure vessels. And moving on, like uh, what components you design, the pressure components are shell head and the small piping connections. These are to be designed as per the pressure vessel code. There is no exemption to that. Let's take a small example. I'll just run quickly through how ASME, we talked a lot about ASME code. I just want to share what ASME code, how does it calculates. Let's take a cylindrical shell of 48 inch ID. And, and the goal is to find out what should be the cylindrical shell thickness, which is marked as T. And this is what ASME code says. If you have to design a pressure vessel for an internal pressure, just go to the class, rule number UG27C1. Just share it out. It's a rule number. The required thickness for internal pressure design for a cylindrical component is PR by SE minus 0.6P. If this looks very complicated, I would say like forget about 0.6p, that's the correction factor, and forget about the c dot ta, it comes to t equals pr by se. That basically boils down to your Hoopstras. Hoopstras is pd by 2t, gets pr, so pr by se. Everything is designed based on Hoopstras, but if you just do the Hoopstras, that ended up in so much of explosions in the history. So ASME has put a lot of conservative design guidelines and they have come up with a lot of correction factors and the expansion, the equation expanded to PR by SC minus 0.6P. I just want to share how the ASME code calculates internal pressure. I think you don't dwell much on that. Okay, so if I do that design for a pressure vessel of 48 inch ID, I'd find that PSIG bonds per square inch and the material used is a carbon steel, SCA516, that the materials pack we use in industry. The last digit 70 stands for ultimate strength, 70 KSI, that is 70,000 PSI. If I have to use a plate material of 70,000 PSI tensile strength, I have to design a cylinder which can withstand a pressure of 500 PSIG at 500 degree Fahrenheit. Then 
using the formula PD by 2 T extended version, I get a thickness of 0.84 inch. So if I have to use, I have to use anything more than that. If I use a place of plate of 0.85 inch thickness, then the equipment is safe. It will not explode for any reasons unless there is a disastrous malfunction. So this is this gives an overview of what uh, how a uh, ASME code tells us to design a pressure equipment cylindrical shell. And there are a lot of materials used in the industry. The carbon steel is the main 80% of materials are carbon steel. Other than carbon steel, we use a lot of uh, stainless steel material, austenitic, ferritic, duplex. If you ever wonder where you use your iron carbide diagram, this is the place we use more of iron carbide diagram, like selection of materials, depending upon the process, temperature, and the service fluid. We also use non-ferrous material, basically monal, inkaloy, inkaloy, these are all chrome nickel alloys aluminum and titanium. So I just thought I'll give you an overview of materials used in the industry. Now, actually we are going on to the pressure equipments used in oil and gas industry. So far, we just had an overview of about the industry, what a pressure equipment, how the SME code designs that. I'll quickly take through the pressure equipments used in oil and gas industry. Uh, types of equipment, there are plenty, but I've just taken a major four items. Heat exchanger, pressure vessel, column, and a storage tank. Let's see what their functions are. Heat exchanger, the name implies it is used to evaporate and condensate either cool or heat a fluid. That's the purpose of heat exchanger. A vessel can be a separator, which is used to separate oil, gas, liquid, water, sorry, water, which we saw in the previous slide. Scrubber, knocking off water droplet from gas, filter to filter any contaminants or any particulates that comes along with uh, well fluid. Then again, we have got a special equipment called column. It, it purpose is again separation. I will talk about that a bit later. And there is a storage vessel and tank, which does nothing, just simply stores the fluid. This is the function of all this main pressure equipments. Heat exchanger, they are the workhorse of oil and gas industry. Uh, you can see a picture, how big it looks like. There are plenty of heat exchanger types. We just picked two, the major type, shell and tube and air-cooled heat exchanger. The purpose of heat exchanger is to transfer heat either to cool or to warm. So again, these heat exchangers are designed to ASME Section 8 Division 1 pressure vessel code. In addition to that, they have also need to comply with some API, American Petroleum Institute. Again, these are industrial guidelines. These guidelines will tell how to design, select a material, fabricate, inspect, test. It's just a rule book. Just simply we'll have to follow that. Then what a shell and tube heat exchanger is about. This is the most common type in the industry. It, it consists of a shell, a large vessel with a bundle of tube inside it. One fluid runs through the tubes and other fluid runs over the tube in the shell, thereby doing a heat transfer between two fluids. I will see a small uh, sketch diagram. If you see that shell, a uh, shell cylinder, uh, sorry, shell, you might know now what it is in the previous slides. And the uh, shell fluid enters in the left side, which is shown a blue arrow. It travels over the tubes in a yes path. And then the tube side, the cold fluid, which is shown in green color, enters the other side. And if you see, there is a small thick line, a partition plate. Uh, dividing those two uh, sections. The tube fluid enters in and flows the tube, take a U-turn at the tube bundle and comes out at the top. Shell flows over the tubes, uh, tube side flows inside the tube. So they, they transfer heat. So probably I'll, I'll just share a 3D picture of it. It, will, it might give you a better idea. Also, I have a small video. Let's see if I can play the video. Yeah. A shell and tube heat exchanger consists of a bundle of tubes placed inside a larger tube 
which is called the shell. The tube fluid, usually the process fluid, flows through the tubes in one direction. The shell fluid, usually the utility fluid, flows through the shell and around all of the tubes in the opposite direction. This is called a counter current. Uh, I'm okay. sorry for some reasons uh, that video is not playing. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah. If you see from this 3D picture, SK sir, can you please can you play the audio video? Is it possible for you to play the video? I'm sorry for some reasons the video is not playing. So. Shell and tube heat exchanger from this picture, you can see like the shell enters at one side, flows over the tubes, there are baffles which guide the flow, and other side, we've got uh, tubes and fluid which enters in through the set of tubes and flow inside the tubes. Probably when end of the presentation, probably you might get a chance to see this uh, video. If not, you can Google out shell and tube heat exchangers working principle. And then there are so many types of uh, combinations of heat exchanger possible. You see that the front end can be a B, C, G type. It's again a configuration. The pass to the shell can be multiple pass. The rear end can be of any of the types listed by TMO. Again, this is the manufacturer's recommended design practices. So the heat exchangers can be from 100 to 200 types of combinations from what we see. Another type of uh, heat exchanger is air cool heat exchanger. When you don't have a cooling medium, we use natural air or air to cool the process fluids. That's air cooled exchanger implied by the name. Basically, it consists the previous shell and tube. We saw the tube bundles inside a shell, but here they are not uh, inside a shell. They're exposed to atmosphere. They are connected to a rectangular box, and the process fluid enters to a rectangular box, the top and flows to the tube to the end, which is shown in blue color, and then takes a U-turn, come back down at the red color. And the cooling is done by atmospheric air, which is pushed up through the fans. You can see the blue arrows and the entire going inside. There are big fans inside that will suck air and pushes over the bundle, thereby doing a heat transfer. I have a video too, but I'm not sure whether this is playing. This cross-sectional view shows the two key air cooler components, the bundles and the fans. Looking a bit closer, we zoom into the air cooler bundle. Here we see the hot process fluid entering the bundle, and as the process fluid moves through the fin tubes, the process fluid's heat is taken away. The process fluid's heat is removed by using colder ambient air. The ambient air is directed over the okay, fin both tubes the videos are by playing, fans. As the sir, shall I play that video, sir? Yeah, if you can, please, sir. If you can, please, okay, play both the videos. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This cross sectional view shows the two key air cooler components the bundles and the fans. Looking a bit closer, we zoom into the air cooler bundle. Here we see the hot process fluid entering the bundle, and as the process fluid moves through the fin tubes, the process fluid's heat is taken away. The process fluid's heat is removed by using colder ambient air. The ambient air is directed over the fin tubes by fans. As the ambient air flows around the fin tubes, the air absorbs or takes away the process fluid's heat. This is just one of the many available air cooler configurations.
Guru sir, you can present the presentation now. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so unfortunately, both of the videos didn't play, but please Google out uh, shell and tube heat exchanger working principle and air cold exchanger that will give you a better idea than explaining. And then uh, the next set of equipment is pressure vessels. We had talked a lot about pressure vessels and the four types are there, separators, scrubbers, columns and storage vessels. And yeah, and again, these are the vessel design codes, which we already seen. I just thought like add it again for refreshment. Sorry. Okay, let's take a separator. This is how the separator vessel looks like. The previous oil and gas facility, we saw a small uh, first vessel. We said it is going to separate oil, gas, and water. And in reality, this is how this equipment looks like. There are special internals inside. Which, which defines how the performance of the separator is achieved or how the oil and gas and water is separated. If you see the inlet device, it has got, uh, okay, it's an inlet device. The inlet fluid flows through it. And because of uh, velocity and density difference, when the inlet fluid strikes, the internal just got plates inside. A gas is thrown out and water and uh, oil as a mixture are thrown out. Gas being light in density travels up water and oil falls down and gets collected. You see a big a blue a liquid being collected. That's a mix of oil and water and gas travels at the top. Taking the gas line first, the gas line exit at the top. And before it goes out, there are special internals. And their purpose is to knock out water particle carried along with the gas. And the size they do is up to 10 microns. Uh, one micron is point not not one mm, so 10 microns, we can imagine. That's the level of filtration this gas device does. Gas goes out at the top. Coming to the liquid aqueous phase, gas, uh, water and oil drops down. There is a plate, we call it as coalescer. Coalescer in the sense it, bub, uh, small oil bubbles are made to join and make a bigger oil bubble. And because of density difference, oil floats at the top and it spills over to another compartment. And again, there is a small coalescer pack. It does a refinement process again. Small oil water droplets, coalescers join together, make a bigger oil droplet float on the surface, and it flows to the next chamber. So this process continues based upon the sizing criteria. The dark blue, what you see aqueous solution is purely water. And the next compartment, what you see hydrocarbon is oil is taken out. So this is the purpose of a separator. And what it does is removes 99% of water droplets of size 10 micron and above in the gas side. And when the oil goes to the next level of separation, we have to make sure the water content is very little, like 10% of water is allowed and the oil content that goes to the next phase of separation before it is pumped out. Similarly, when the water is dumped back, we cannot have more than 100 ppm, particulate per million of water. So that's the purpose of separator. And this is what uh, the industry expectation for separator is. And the sizing and uh, everything depends upon the performance. Everything depends upon the internal selected. The internals are supplied by very specialized vendors and their business is just supplying the internals. The vessel as such you have seen, it's designed to ASME code. And a lot more. The next equipment is scrubber. It's a knockout drum. We just had a short line of that. The purpose of knockout drum is to take out water droplets from the gas before it goes into the compressor. Compressor compresses the gas, and we can't expect to have water droplets in the compressor that will corrode the metal, like uh, the compressor internal. So we make sure the gas is 99.9% .9 free of water droplets. And the size of water droplet that is removed is three microns, it's point not not three. The separator does have to 10 micron, and further refinement of uh, removing water droplets from gas is done by scrubber vessel, up to three microns. Again, the size of the vessel, it's all defined by the type of internals we select. There are plenty of options available in the industry. Every client, uh, every oil and gas companies has a list of uh, vendors. Who, who they believe that, who they trust 
they do a good job or have a good track history. So we go and buy from them. And then this is a very specialized item, column. You know, a separator can separate oil, gas, and water, but not the hydrocarbon mix. Whatever, uh, you know, like mutually soluble solution cannot be separated in a separator. So we go to this special equipment, it is called column. Uh, the purpose of column is to separate mutually soluble solution. In hydrocarbon, it has got so many hydrocarbon chains. So if you heat at a certain temperature, some of the hydrocarbon releases out. For example, if you see the small sketch over there, when you heat crude and pushes it to the top towards the internals, we call it a tray. There is a mass transfer, mass of heat transfer happening towards inside the tray. If you keep pushing the hydrocarbon up through the trays and keep heating it, at 20 degrees centigrade, you get a gas that is used for uh, used in the LPG cylinders. And then you progress, and then going high with the temperature, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm using the iPad now. At 70 degree, you get lubricants, you keep heating at 150 or 120 degree, you get petrol for cars. Further heating at 170 degree, you get uh, jet aviation fuel. It, as you increase the heat, you get different products. So this equipment is called a column. This is a very highly specialized equipment. And the diameter can range from three meter diameter, 12 meter diameter. The so length can be up to 30 or 20 meters, depending upon what you want to separate. Uh, very highly specialized uh, equipment. It, uh, it, it sees a lot of wind load and seismic load. It shouldn't topple highly critical equipment in the industry. And the next one is uh, storage tank. This does nothing, just you separate the crude, it goes and gets stored. It's a pressure vessel, but it's very, very less pressure at a pressure of two PSIG or not more than 15 PSIG. Basically, you could have seen like when you travel, when you look around, you'll see a lot of oil uh, tanks uh, in many parts of uh, or nearby our place. So this purpose of this tank is simply to store store the fluid separated, crude, rather crude separated. And I think pretty much we have done, uh, I've covered, uh, yeah, almost all what I had to, had to share with you all. Thank you for your time and happy to take if you have any questions. If not, please do contact me through SK Sir. Yes, it's my email. I'm happy to share any industrial experience or if you have any queries in oil and gas, or if you need any guidance in oil and gas industry, I'm happy to help please feel free to contact me. Thank you. If you have any questions, please. Uh, uh, Guru sir, I got noted yes. some questions from the participants from the chat box. Okay. Uh, first question is from pressure equipment is same for chemical compounds like sulfur and ammonia, etc. Uh, see, the process doesn't matter. The ASME code is the same. Where it yes. is different from oil and gas or chemical ammonia is the material selection and internal selection. The overall shell, end cap, the nozzle, all, all designed using the basic formula. But there will be some specialized material selection properties which you have to take care of for the service fluid. Whether it is oil or it is ammonia or sulfuric acid, the material properties differ. The material selection plays a key role. Okay, thank you. Sir, so the next question. Is the storage tanks characterized under the pressure equipment or not? Storage tank. It is not. It is not as a pressure equipment. I just added as one of the major equipment in oil and gas industry. But if you see, there is a tank, API 620 tank. It can take more than two psig. It can see up to 15 psig. Technically speaking, they are not pressure equipment. Yes, yes, yes. So next question from one participant. Uh, what are the methods yes. used for internal inspection for pressure equipments? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, what are the various methods used for internal inspection of pressure equipments? See, the, the equipment is fabricated mostly by welding. 99% of equipment in the industry is all welding. Okay. So, I, if, I, if I understand the question rightly, the inspection of weld joints, mm -hmm. you can do, uh, like once it is fabricated and it is on field, and if you want to inspect the equipment for any reason, you do. Uh, you enter the equipment and you do a LP, a liquid penetrant test or a magnetic particle test. This is the ND inspection you can do on a very basic level. 
if that uh, questionnaire is not satisfied, he can be very specific uh -huh. if I didn't answer his question correctly. Yeah. Next to that, uh, which company is producing yeah. the pressure vessels and uh, related equipments? Uh, there are plenty of companies here. The pressure equipment, uh, the biggest one in India is LNT. Uh, BHL got a very Lord. big plant in Hazira. Sorry, uh, Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. BHL, Bell, sir, Bell, Trichy. That is also uh, producing Bell also. Yeah, sorry, Bell also. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely, definitely. Yes. Uh, Bell is mostly boilers. The pressure ah. equipment are done from uh, BHPV in Andhra. Boil, both heavy plate vehicles, I don't know. There is one big unit as good as Bell. Bell is basically a boiler production, definitely. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, next question from one participant. Is all storage yeah. tank considered as a pressure equipment? Oil storage tank? No, we just uh, talked about that. If it is designed for as per APA, it is not technically, it is not. If it is a storage tank, it is not a pressure equipment at all. Uh, okay. Sir. So next, who will uh, set the criteria of design and based on what uh, criteria? Who will set the criteria for the design yes. and equipment? Yeah, okay. Like I, I was giving this on a perspective of mechanical based. There are multiple disciplines involved. There is a discipline called process division, basically chemical engineers, and they interacting with client will determine what is the process requirement, what is the endpoint client wants to achieve when they transport the gas, how much quantity of water allowed per million scaffold of gas, say two pounds of water allowed. So from there, they back calculate and fix the process criteria. And they will say this, I want a scrubber with 99% of one micron water in the exit. And, and we will go to the vendors and size the vessel. Basically, process team defines the selection criteria. And mechanical team takes it to the market, discuss with the specialized vendors, explore various options, and we work as a team. It's multiple discipline involvement. Yes, yes. thank you, sir. So next to one of our alumni moments, Sagal has asked one question, sir. Uh, do we need mm -hmm. to have any safety relief valve for storage tanks? Storage for uh, ASME pressure vessel, definitely yes. Storage tank, we do have a breather vent, which is designed as per APA code. I don't remember. My specialty is mostly into offshore, so very little experience on storage tanks, so I'm not able to answer the question correctly. Sorry. Okay, sir. Uh, next... Uh... What is the maximum thickness of column? It depends upon the size and the pressure. You cannot give a one right answer for this. If it is one meter diameter and pressure is five bar, then use PD by 2T. If it is 10 meter diameter column with one bar, it's a different thickness. Okay. So next, how to and what are the needs for students to get placement in this type of industries? That's Please a very good question. I thought this will come through. Yeah. See, uh, fortunately, India has got a lot of uh, big oil and gas companies setting up their offices in the recent past, the last 10 years. In Chennai alone, we have got eight major engineering contractors who are doing billions of projects across the globe. But most of the companies, uh, okay, to answer this, the first step is to get an internship in any of these companies to gain the basic knowledge of what's happening in the industry. Yes. And then develop your skills, what you want to be like. Oil and gas industry is very vast. You can be a project management guy, you can be a technical guy, you can be a technician, you can be a welding engineer. So you'll have to choose what you want to be in the industry and develop the skills in that particular area. This is what I can think of. Mostly all this, uh, all this uh, intake for graduates happens through campus interviews. Yes, yes. And yeah. Sir, uh, next question. Uh, environmental and safety certificate standards for the company and the manufacturers are needed. Environmental, Sorry, and, the safety safety the question. environmental and safety certificates. It is needed for, for? the environmental and safety certificates. Uh, needed for the company and the manufacturer for this type of industries. Definitely any pressure equipment, if you're going to design as per any pressure vessel code, and the equipment is has got a, after doing the final fabrication, the equipment has to be stamped 
by authority. So you will have to take the approval from ASME to use their stamp. So every equip, every fabricator or manufacturer, they will have to strictly follow a safety uh, aspect in their fabrication, which is again defined by the ASME or any governing body or local Indian governing body. And environmental issues depending upon what they fabricate. For a pressure vessel fabricator, yes, they do a lot of NDT and how do they make sure their people are not exposed to hazard or the outside is not exposed to hazard. Yes, they have to strictly follow environmental and safety regulations. Okay, sir. Uh, one more question from Geeta Kannapan. Uh, is there any courses yep. for the type of pressure equipments are available? Uh, or, uh, I am not sure about what, what is there in India, but definitely there are plenty of courses available. Aye, aye. Any specified agencies for training in Chennai, sir? Uh, I, I left India in 2006, so I have I don't have much contacts there. I can find it out. Definitely, please put, put through all these questions to me. If, if I yeah. can't answer offhand, I can definitely... Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, sir. So that's all the question from the participants. Uh, sh shall I play that prior video, sir? One mystery video? Yeah, please. Before that, uh, excellent questions and thank you for all the participants for your time and interest. Please feel free to contact me. Yeah. Uh, I will play the first video now. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. A shell and tube heat exchanger consists of a bundle of tubes placed inside a larger tube, which is called the shell. The tube fluid, usually the process fluid, flows through the tubes in one direction. The shell fluid, usually the utility fluid, flows through the shell and around all of the tubes in the opposite direction. This is called a counter current design. The shell contains baffles to support the tubes and repeatedly redirect the shell fluid across the tube bundle. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, now the time for uh, what are thanks, sir? Yeah. Uh, just a minute. Okay, thank you. Uh, on behalf of EGS Pala Engineering College and the Department of Mechanical Engineering, I take this opportunity to thank Mr. Guru Tiagu, sir, for his for your excellent presentation in the topic of overview of pressure equipment in oil and gas industry. I am very much proud that Mr. Guru Tiagu is our alumni of EGS Pala Engineering College, Nagapatnam. Without petroleum products, we cannot run the, uh, any of the product in the world. So it is very much useful for all the participants. Uh, the, next, I would like to thank all the participants from various institutions and industries, especially from ONGC Karakal. So many participants from ONGC Karakal have particip participated in this webinar. I thank you very much, sir. And I would like to thank our chairman, uh, Mr. Jodhimani Ammal, and our secretary, Dr. S. Parameswaran, and trust members for the support to conduct this webinar. Then I would like to thank our CEO, Dr. Chandrasekharan sir, for his, <coughs> for his excellent efforts taken by him to conduct this type of webinars. Then I would like to thank our principal, Dr. S. Rama Balan sir, for his welcome letters given for today's webinar. I thank all the HODs and the faculties of VJ School Engineering College. Once again, I thank Mr. Guru Tyagarajan sir for his excellent webinar hosting with this, I conclude the webinar. Thank you very much all. All the participants will get the link, a certificate registration link to their mail, the registered mail ID. Just register your uh, details. You will get the certificate by tomorrow. Uh, today itself, you will get, uh, by maximum, you will get the uh, certificate by tomorrow. Thank you very much. Let us leave the webinar. Thank you, Mr. Gurti sir. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Thank you all. Thank Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.